If you were to go outside and stop uh, the average person on the street and say to them, who are the two most famous Texas oil men in, the, in America? They would probably tell you J.R. Ewing and Boone Pickens. Oh. Um, Can now, I tell a story? Now, in the case of J.R. Ewing. Can I tell a story? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, you know, the oil business is pretty sad right now. <clears throat> and this woman was walking down Travis Street in Houston, and uh, there was a, a frog in the, in the gutter and said, stop, stop. And she, she looked at him and she said, did you say that? He said, yes, I'm a talking frog. Pick me up. She picked him up, looked at him and said, you really are a talking frog. Yeah, he said, I had this horrible spell cast over me and, and it, it made me a, a frog. And said, if you'll kiss me, said, uh, I will turn into a Texas oil man. And she looked at him and said, uh, zipped her purse, put him down and said, wait just a second. If you kiss me, I'll turn into a Texas oil man. She said, let me tell you something. A talking frog today is worth a hell of a lot more than a Texas oil man. <laughs> the the reason I draw that comparison is J.R. Ewing is fiction. And that whole picture of oil industry was the fantasy of Hollywood writers, not a reflection on reality. What you've got here on the stage is reality. This is fact. This is fact that's passed into legend of Boone Pickens, and who's also not from Texas, but from Oklahoma, from near Seminole, is that correct? Seminole, Oklahoma? Is that Seminole, Oklahoma, is that near where you were born and raised? Your dad was a... You say Seminole? Yeah. 20 miles. 20 miles from outside Hol Holdenville. Holdenville. Yeah, but you know, you said that about legend, and the other day I, somebody introduced me to the legend. I said, I figured out what this legend deal is. If you're 75 years old and still have a job, you're a legend. <laughs> Actually, that is not true. Because when I worked on Wall Street in the 1980s, you were less than 70 years old, and you were a legend then. You were a legend then not only as probably the greatest and most creative of all the Texas independent uh, oil producers, but also by then, of course, you had moved into other kinds of areas. You were one of the first, for example, to see the value and the importance of oil futures and the oil futures market. And you had become involved with another guy by the name of Carl Icahn, in the process of shaking up America's corporate leadership uh, and corporate boardrooms, including in the oil and gas industry. I'm going to interrupt you again. New York Times called me the other day and said, Carl Icahn said, you're an old friend of his, yeah. Uh, give us some comment about him. I said, okay. Carl has done more for stockholders in America uh, than any CEO that I know. And I said, but Carl, is about as smooth as a stucco bathtub. <laughs> and Carl called me. Goddamn, what the hell are you doing? I said, what happened, Carl? He said, you said I was smooth as a stucco bathtub. <laughs> I'm smoother than that. I said, Carl, I said you were the smartest guy that I... I know it, I know it, but he said, stucco bathtub, I'm smoother than that. So, <laughs> so am I going to get to finish this introduction, or are we going to go on at this rate? I like and it. it's interesting, what I liked about that was, is that, you know, of course, the, the role that you guys played was caricatured in a movie called Wall Street with a guy by the name of Gary Gecko, and his motto was supposedly, Creed. greed is good. The actual motto that Boone Pickens brought to America's boardrooms is performance is required. And if you were going to draw down as a senior executive a five or a six, uh, a, a six or a seven figure salary, you better show something to the people who really should have the power in that company, and that's the shareholders. I also believe that the work that you guys did, and you in particular, really helped to save the oil and gas industry for was it was going to be a very rough patch through the 80s and into the 90s. Then in 2000, looking around 2000 or so, you began to look around for other kinds of ideas and began to sort of see, as you always do, sort of where the future lay for Americans energy sector and where America's oil and gas sector was going to be headed. 
you know, I think it was 2007, 2008, you put together the Pickens Plan, which was an, a, a series of measures that you felt were important if America was going to recognize the energy future that was coming, particularly with regard to the impact of shale and the shale revolution. A lot of people thought what they were going to get with that, and they read the, uh, the, the, the Pickens Plan was policy. What they actually got was prophecy. You prophesied the world we now live in now, the energy that we situation we now face with a natural gas abundance of a size that is almost, I think, to most Americans, unimaginable. According to a recent study I saw by the Chicago School of Mines, we're looking at 2.3 quadrillion, I say quadrillion cubic feet of recoverable natural gas in the United States, enough to serve our energy needs for decades. Now, here's my question. Introduction's done, by the way. Here's my question for you. Three times, I think there's three events that have embedded themselves in the collective memories of Americans, of seeing how they think about their world. One was Pearl Harbor. The second was 9-11. The third were the gas lines of 1973, after the Arab oil embargo, in which America came to believe that its energy future was one of constantly diminishing expectations, that the only way in which we could uh, find a way forward with energy was through conservation, that eventually oil and natural gas were going to run out. As late as 2005, we were told, natural gas was finished as American, part, and we would have to spend all of our time and effort now into importing natural gas. I don't think Americans have caught up with the new reality that's taken place here, but you have. And had, did you ever think that it was going to be possible in, from that perspective that we would see in America future in terms of abundant energy and above all abundant natural gas the way has come about as you had prophesied? You say, did I see it coming? Uh, I understand it now, but let me, let me take you back a few years. Uh, I'm a geologist, and I got out of school, Oklahoma State, in 1951, and I've practiced geology and been in the oil and gas industry ever since. And uh, but I uh, uh, believed in the peak oil theory, and uh, and you remember when that? Yeah. Okay. And I predicted peak oil for the world in. With help, I had help on this because the first guy uh, helped me. Jay, what's his name? King. Uh, oh, yeah, King Hubbard. King Hubbard. Yeah, he's the guy that picked peak oil. If you remember, he was a shell uh, uh, engineer, and but I I read uh, King Hubbard's book and I bought in to the deal because. Could see the decline in oil. We peaked in the United States in 1970 at 10 million barrels a day, and then we proceeded to just go down. Well, uh, you had the big discovery at Prudhoe Bay in '76, which propped us up million, two million barrels, but then right back on the same decline curve. So why wouldn't I buy in? Uh, you'd be a fool if you didn't because you could see the two billion barrel oil fields were history. I mean, one billion barrel oil fields were found in the 70s, and now you're down to 500 million barrels. So you're finding smaller and smaller oil fields, and they're declining faster. So it was an easy uh, conclusion. To come to, you know, your, your peak oil is going to come. Well, I predicted 85, and honestly, I hit it. Now, uh, Hubbard's gone. He's dead. He can't predict out that far and everything else. I'm sitting right on top of the period, and so it's easier for me to see 85 was it. We did peak, and uh, it, that, that's, uh, that's it around the world. 
and everything now is going to be in decline, and we're going to have to go to a different energy source at some point, not too distant future. Then you had horizontal drilling that occurred in the United States, and I did not predict that, didn't see it coming. And uh, when I first saw it, I, honestly, I couldn't believe it. I, I, that, now here you drill a well down to 9,000 feet and put it in a bend and then run it out 5,000 feet. They're running them out now 10,000 feet on the horizontal hole. And then they frack them 40, 50, 60 times in there. Well, you have what you actually have, you have one hole in the ground with multiple wells in within the one hole is what it amounts to. We reached in 1981, third quarter of 1981, we reached 4,521 rigs running in the United States. You don't need that many now. And uh, I made a great prediction then uh, that the Goddard and McNaughton, who were our engineers, uh, they said we decline, come back to 3,500 rigs. And I bet all the D&M guys $10 that you'd never see 3,500 rigs operating in the United States again. And the reason I said that is I thought we'd run out of places to drill. Did we ever see 3,500? No, because we then, as time passed, you went in a horizontal hole and you didn't need 3,500. So if the D&M guys, most of them are dead, if they were still around, they would claim foul because the horizontal hole created more wells uh, and you didn't need 40, uh, 3,500 rigs. But anyway, uh, I have so many of this history and recall, and I'm lucky enough to have a pretty good memory that I can remember these things. But 85 was when, and if you go back and look, uh, and it takes, you've got to do some manipulation to look at it closely. But you really did peak. Global peak was in about 85, if you hadn't gone to horizontal drilling. And so here you are, the American industry, when I got out of school, that it was, everybody knew that 90, over 90% 90 of the oil in the world had been found by American geologists and geophysicists. Over 90% had been. Today, it's about the same. The United States geologists and, and uh, geophysicists have found 90% of the oil in the world. And today, 5 million wells have been drilled in the world. And guess what? Over half of them have been drilled in the United States. You say, well, if that's the case, then it should have been depleted and the United States shouldn't have any more oil and gas. They've drilled more wells over a long period of time. It should be over with for us. Not so. We now have more natural gas than any country in the world. Colorado School of Mines, you said. Uh, the, I'm, I'm not a, that quick on quadrillions or whatever, but I, I, I thought, I think there's four, four trillion, four thousand trillion, and that may be the same number. It's a little bit less, yeah. That's, that's, they say that's technically recoverable. And technically recoverable, as you know, is constantly changing and improving the technical recovery, so. Well, it, uh, we have unbelievable. You're, you're both, you're in the same ballpark. Yeah. Speaking quadrillions, yeah. Yeah, which is huge. Yeah. yeah and it, and it'll take us well beyond when I die. So whatever I say, what the hell, I'll be gone. When, when it comes out. When somebody really knows what the number is. But I can tell you it's unbelievable how much natural gas we have. And we have this. And if you look at the, at the better end of the hydrocarbon chain, the, the best end of it is natural gas. It's the best fuel in the chain. And we are using the bottom. We're using the bottom, the, the oil, and a lot of heavy oil uh, and, and all. And here, and of course, emissions are not good on, on uh, that, that kind of uh, 
energy, but the natural gas is so much cleaner. But we never had leadership in Washington. Uh, I thought at that time you would applause because it didn't. We don't have any leadership in Washington a long time for a lot of things. But we've never had for energy. We've never had. Uh, uh, they, last night I had dinner with the senator, and he said, do you think oil prices will stay 35 to 40 for the next five years? And I said, no, I don't. He said, well, that's what I was told. And I said, well, quit listening to that person because they don't know what they're talking about. But no, it's not going to stay at 35, 40. It can't stay there because one factor to focus on is drilling rig count. You look at drilling rig count around the world, and they're shut down. The rigs don't drill, you don't get oil, and you are always dealing with a decline curve on production. The first oil field, the first well in the, fir in the oil field that you find, you take, start taking oil out of it, you are removing oil from a, a reservoir that's quantifiable, and it is, has less the next day than it did the day before. So it's going to decline is what's going to happen. And so today you're producing 93 million barrels of oil every day in the world, everybody's production, Mideast, United States, Canada, wherever. It's 93 million barrels. 70% of that goes to transportation fuel. But 93 million barrels is growing at a million and a half barrels a day. So next year we'll need 94 and a half. You shut down all the drilling rigs, and a very safe number to use is you will decline at 4% a year. So the 93 million barrels will be declining at 3 or 4 million barrels a, a day. I'm giving daily numbers. It will decline 3 or 4 million barrels a day. So you have to replace. Now, how much oversupply do we have the 93 million barrels? One and a half million barrels. So it's tight. It's, it's tight. tight. It's very tight. So what's going to happen is the oil price is going to go back up. Is what's going to happen. But the unbelievable, uh, the natural gas price. You have so much natural gas, and it's here in the United States. It's available to us, and it's going to be a long time before it goes up very much. Now, parity natural gas to oil is six to one. So if you have $100 oil, then natural gas should be $16 in MCF. Natural gas today is $2.50 in MCF. Okay, $50 oil would be $8 in MCF. And it's two fifty, so it's a fraction of the value of oil. So you think, my God, if natural gas will do the same thing as gasoline, why don't we switch over to natural gas? Okay, leadership, leadership X, no leadership, never took you in that direction, and tremendous amount of lobbying against anything like that, but. You can never go wrong natural gas over gasoline or diesel because it is over half the, the, the emissions are 50% better out of natural gas and it's cheaper and it's domestic. Now I started selling that idea in 1988 and I said it'll take me three years to penetrate the market. Cheaper, cleaner, and domestic and nobody can argue against me. There wouldn't be anybody in the back room say, you're a fraud. I'll tell you why. And then says something. Nobody gets up in the back of the room. They never have because it's true. All of them are factual. I said, three years I'll penetrate the market. That was 88. This is 2016. 28 years ago, and I'm still trying to penetrate the market. I never have broken in that natural gas is a better transportation fuel than gasoline or diesel. I'll tell you something else. I think one of the things when you unveiled the Pickens plan 
one of the things that surprised a lot of people was they thought of you as the consummate oil guy, and here you are touting natural gas and the conversion to natural gas and the infrastructure. And I'll tell you this, I think there's a lot of people who wish that a chunk, a fraction of the money that was spent by the Obama administration in economic stimulus to get us out of the crash that came in 2000, 2009, that if a fraction of that $800 million had been spent on converting the U.S. economy and infrastructure to natural gas, we'd be in a whole lot better place today. But Arthur, you, you don't need to, the government doesn't need to pay a dime to convert. Nope. No. You don't need to pay a dime to convert. You need to, to one, understand it, be able to talk about it. We had a Natural Gas Act <clears throat> in, it was five years ago, and what it did is that heavy-duty trucks just start there and then let it go wherever it goes. It, it will move once a segment picks it up. <clears throat> Excuse me. And... So, uh, it, in that Natural Gas Act, what we had, it, it was a tax credit, mm -hmm. which isn't a subsidy. And, and it was to, uh, if you were, it was a model that came out of Southern California. Uh, the, they had a guy there that uh, he, uh, he was a leader. And he had air emission issues to deal with. So he said, what are the biggest polluters that, that I can have influence over? They said, trash trucks. Diesel, idle a lot, uh, and all, and emissions are terrible. <clears throat> I said, okay, switch it over to natural gas, and you will clean up 75% of your emission problem out of those trucks. Okay, what's it cost me to get it there? He said $50,000. It's a new idea, and <clears throat> there, there's costs involved. Well, it was the South Coast Air Quality Management District, AQMD. And AQMD had money and taxing authority. So he said, if you're in the trash hauling business, when you buy a new truck, it has to be natural gas can't go back to diesel <clears throat> and we will give a uh, we will give fifty thousand dollars was what the incremental difference was so he said we'll grant you fifty thousand and you go to natural gas well you I mean that's easy <laughs> that's a done deal to start with if it's mandated and they're going to pay you well, hell, is nobody even argues. Okay, that was about 10 years ago. <clears throat> All of Southern California today, there's no, no longer any grants. So you know that plan worked, and there are no diesel trash trucks. Because you could phase out the subsidy. Yeah, the subsidy went away. And, well, he was a dictator. Wallerstein was. He, he, he told them what to do, and they did it. <clears throat> but he, it, what he, his, uh, uh, you know, his, his plan made sense. But now on that Natural Gas Act, we had if you if that had passed, and it passed, uh, we had to have sixty votes, and we got fifty four. And but if that had passed, uh, that was five years ago. You would have your heavy duty trucks in the United States would be basically hmm. over two. That would have saved you three million barrels of oil. Now the United States is using 20 million barrels a day and importing about half of it. Even with the oil production we've got. Here. That's right. <clears throat> Our production got back up to 9.7 million barrels a day two years ago. We were 10 million and 70, went down to four, brought it back up. This I never believed would happen. I never believed you would have a recovery like that. I, I, in this geologist's mind, <laughs> it was impossible. And, uh, and you did it by technology is what you did. And uh, the, so here you went back to 9.7. You're down now to 
you're in decline because you don't have any rigs working. <clears throat> and you'll be down another half a million barrels by July 4th. You'll be down to 8-7 by July 4th. So it, it, it will decline rapidly and, uh, and, but point was, anybody got a question now? And I've got it. I've got a, I've got one last question. And then, if you're into it, we'll open up to some, some to some questions from the audience because I know people have things they want to ask. But here's the situation: there's a new president who comes in. It's January, end of January, 2017. He sits down with you, says, "What are the three most important things that I can do to meet, to bring, and to extend and deepen America's?" energy independence and America's energy security in my administration. What are the three things you're going you're gonna to yeah, tell? First, let me tell you a story about it. Uh, Senator Obama uh, asked me to meet with him in Reno, Nevada <clears throat> in, what would it be, August of 08? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, uh, he was already in the room, and I walked up, and, and the guy there said, uh, he only has 20 minutes. And I said, what's he want me to do? And he said, explain to him all about the oil industry. <laughs> and I said, hey, uh, uh, I, we don't, you can't get that in 20 minutes. And then, so we go in. We were there an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah. So, long. so it, it was, <clears throat> he learned more than the uh, oil industry. But uh, we talked, and he, I mean, bless his heart, I mean, he had no reason to know anything about the industry. And he asked if he could take notes, and I said yes. And so uh, we now we're getting close to the end of the discussion. Uh, oh, uh, David Axelrod was with him, and, and uh, uh, Rosser, Jay Rosser, my guy, was there. The four of us were in the room. And <clears throat> we... We went. It was it was all serious talk for an hour and fifteen minutes, and <clears throat> he said, "Do I say things that that uh, uh, you know make you uneasy or offend you or anything about the oil industry?" I said, "Yeah, as a matter of fact, you do." And he said, "What is it?" And I said, "You say you're going to have one million plug-in hybrids on the highway in the United States in ten years." Boy, I saw a side of him that I've seen since. He's on his feet. He said, let me tell you something, Mr. Pickens. When I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. Uh, whoa, wait a minute. And, and boy, he's got his finger. right? And I said, you want me to tell you now what makes me laugh that you say? And he said, all right, what? I said, that's exactly what I mean. Walk over at this window. You look out. We walked over to win. I said, on that parking lot, if you had a million cars there, it'd look like a lot of cars, wouldn't it? He said, it would be a lot of cars. He, he Now he's not real friendly. And I said, now you step back, pal, and look out that window. Now you're looking at America. There's 250 million vehicles in America, and in 10 years you're going to have 1 million plug-in hybrids. That's what makes me laugh. And he went, huh, well, it's not very many, is it? I said, yeah, that's what makes me laugh. You don't know what you're talking about. Now, he's a senator. He's not the president of the United States at this point. He's running for president. So I don't, would I have said that to him if he was president? I would now. I don't know that I would have a month after <laughs> that he was president. But he, he, didn't, he didn't understand. He did, and he never said it again. He never said plug-in hybrids, a million of them. And so the, uh, if I sat with the, the President of the United States, that it, uh, I, w I would say that, you know, you have, where you start off the speech is we are going to use our own resources. That's where you start. And we will. We can use our own resources. But... I would then add, we need to bring together for the national security of the United States, North America. Bring Canada, Mexico, and the United States together 
and now you have the North American Energy Alliance. We're the market for Canadian oil and Mexican oil that they export. And that fills us out to where we are energy independent. Now, you want to reduce the heavy-duty trucks. Don't try to reduce your car. Just the heavy-duty trucks, and that will get pick up 3 million barrels a day. Just take the heavy-duty trucks to cleaner natural gas and cheaper natural gas. And that's about the extent of the energy plan. It's not any more complicated than that. Now, I also said wind and solar. And wind and solar should be developed. But wind and solar are power. Power does not move an 18-wheeler. The only thing that moves an 18-wheeler is diesel or natural gas. You can't move an 18-wheeler with a battery. You can, but the battery would be bigger than the truck. But the, uh, uh, but you, so it, it's not complicated. It's pretty easy to understand. And of course, they all have you know half a dozen people there checking everything you say, and they should. It, you, you should be able to support everything you tell them. And uh, but it, an energy plan for America uh, would, and you do not need anything from the Mid East. Uh, let's go back to 73. You remember when they put the 5th Fleet in the Mediterranean? They based the 5th Fleet there in 75. That's after Congress came to the conclusion, my God, we're declining oil production in the United States. We're going to be dependent on Mideast for oil forever after. I believe that. I bought that. And, and so they moved the 5th Fleet in there, based it out of Bahrain, and... Uh, but today, you don't need the Fifth Fleet. You, you, need, uh, you need help for Israel. Uh, I'll, but you don't need two aircraft carriers. And, uh, and I made a s statement, and I, I really appreciated how close they were watching it. But they called me from the Pentagon, and I'd been there and talked to them. And they said, uh, Mr. Pickens, you said we had four aircraft carriers in a speech. And in in uh, in the Mediterranean, in the Persian Gulf, and I said I did say four. I said we don't we don't have four. We have two. And I said, well, wh where did I get four? I said you got four someplace. And they said, well, two are outside the boundary. I said, well, they're in the district. <laughs> and, but it was interesting though. They they corrected me, and I appreciated that. Uh, you don't want to ever pass out false information, and uh, but it's uh, uh, the military. They they listen to what I say, and because what I say is, they are very interested in that energy is national security, yeah, right? And it it's so it, it's you know it's it, it may be the centerpiece, but it uh, but. I'd love for the president to get up and say, we don't need any more oil from the Mideast. But let me tell you what we get from the Mideast. It's uh, Straits Hormuz, 17 million barrels a day comes through the Straits Hormuz. 17 million. Fifth Fleet sits there and shepherds that activity. How much of the 17 million do we get? Less than ten percent. It's a million two hundred thousand barrel. Now, when this guy Trump says, you know, they're going to pay, they're going to pay for uh, they other countries are going to pay us for what we do for them. That makes sense to me. That remark that he makes about that, right here's one, and I. I asked him at the Pentagon, I said, can we charge the, the 16 million barrels of oil that comes through the Straits Armus? It goes where? China and Europe. Can we charge them for being sure these tankers come through without any problem? They said, you can charge them, they won't pay you. <laughs> so, I mean, they got it, but they, I'm not here for Trump. Don't get that idea. 
But, but this is the kind of stuff that he would jump on like a duck on a June bug. I like it. I like the thing. Energy is national security, and that's really what has come, what it comes down to, and where a na I think a national energy policy needs to go. Should we take a couple of questions from the audience? Sure. To the back there, and then up here in the front. Yeah, you, yeah, that young man there who just raised his hand. And again, if you could just identify yourself and tell us about your affiliation. Uh, Connor Dolan with the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association. Uh, I just wanted to ask a question for Mr. T. Boone. Given that the automakers and the industry for transportation seems to be heading towards a zero emission future, we have states mandating zero emission vehicles, and we have automakers increasingly putting out zero emission vehicles. Have you given any thought to supporting hydrogen derived uh, from natural gas as a zero emission transportation play for the industry? It seems like it would be an interesting play to further the natural gas transportation industry? The way I've answered the question many times, I'm for anything that's American. I don't care what it is, if it's American, I'm for it. Uh, and of course, a hydrogen would be American because it would be uh, probably taken from natural gas. But the, uh, uh, so hydrogen fuel, it's too expensive now. And we actually have a hydrogen pump in a station at LAX, uh, Clean Energy Fuels, sells natural gas there, station, uh, and it and uh, General Motors uh, pays us rent to put a hydrogen uh, fuel pump there. And it's used uh, maybe one time a month. So hydrogen hasn't... Uh, gotten the imagination of the public, but neither has natural gas. I mean, natural gas is, has not been easy to sell for transportation fuel. So it's, uh, you've got a tough road to hoe, but uh, if I'm for you. I think, you know, if it works and it does better than natural gas, use it. What's best for America is best for me. I, I'm right there. Hi, Boone. Thanks for your comments. Dave Ramaswamy with Africa Agribusiness Magazine. You know, thousands of American servicemen's lives have been sacrificed at the altar of OPEC. And American taxpayers not only fund the Fifth Fleet and the military, by buying OPEC oil, a lot of it finds its way to radical Islamic groups like Al-Qaeda, the ISIS, Taliban. So in this election cycle, when there's a huge undercurrent of fear in the American public against radical Islam and terror. How can the messaging that you have, you know, cheaper, domestic, uh, better for the environment, I mean, how can we rally millions of Americans to call their congressmen right, you know, to change the narrative on natural gas as a source of energy? Thank you. That's a really good question. And, but, I, and, and I think one of the things, can you really think about America's natural gas, future natural gas economy as opening a kind of second front against Islamic terrorism and the state sponsors of terrorism. Well, I mean, your question, though, you, the way it's asked, you're saying that we're dependent on oil from the Mideast, and that's why we have military and everything else over there, right? Or historically, but that's changing. It's changed. It for sure has changed, but we still have... I mean, we're we're getting pe people killed over there, and uh, in uh, I know last week we got the Marine killed, but uh, not as many. We haven't lost as many, but the the natural gas you've got to have a sponsor, a champion, uh, somebody that buys in to it. And you'd have to, if you want to criticize somebody, you'd say, well, Boone, you haven't been much of a salesman. Okay, I don't think I have either. I haven't been that good a salesman. Uh, and, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a premier fuel. I can't believe it's, it's better than what you're using and it's cheaper and it's cleaner. Now, that is all true. <laughs> it's all true. And you think, and it's homegrown. Yeah, and it's uh, but now 
that uh, that who beat us and we would have won that natural gas act and we would have been well on our way today to going to natural gas for serious transportation fuel but it was Coke brothers that beat us they they came in why were they against us because they sell fertilizer they sell plastics they import 62,000 barrels of oil from the mid east and they take the ethanol subsidy so what does that mean it means all of those I'm against and all of them therefore because they, they didn't want to get they envisioned that if you got uh, demand for natural gas price go up and they like all the rest of us didn't know how much natural gas we have and uh, and they were enjoying the greatest margins they had ever had in their business and so they did not want natural gas to get into transportation fuel that that's the reason they said it was cause of subsidy but they take the subsidy off the ethanol deal so I mean they must, you know, believe in if it's coming their way. That's right. Yeah. I'm going to make one quick correction on you. It's not that you were a bad salesman. It's that you were too far ahead of the curve. Uh, now you're on the curve. You are the curve. And that's why I think this is an opportunity like no other to see those, those elements in the natural gas economy coming into fruition. Dan Cohn from MIT. I have a question for uh, Mr. Pickens about the uh, greenhouse gas implications of uh, using natural gas in trucks. And it has to do with the fugitive emissions of uh, natural gas. Because uh, natural gas is such a potent uh, greenhouse gas, only a small amount of uh, fugitive uh, emissions can actually cause the uh, net greenhouse gas effect of using natural gas in trucks to be greater than the greenhouse gas from diesel trucks. Is this an issue that uh, should be of concern? You're saying, you're, you're asking the question, is diesel actually cleaner than natural gas? On a greenhouse gas basis. Uh, you know, I, I say no, and if you ask me to give you percentages, I, I, I couldn't. Uh, I do know that, that when you look at California, which is a great place to look at natural gas for transportation fuel, <clears throat> and there's, I, you know, from Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles, it's almost like, uh, it, as far as natural gas is concerned, they don't even know where it is. I mean, they don't pay any attention. I tell them, I say, look at what they did out there. I mean, they had smog in Los Angeles where I would look at smog days before I travel from Texas to California to see what the smog looked like. If I could put a trip off a day or two, I would wait for a cleaner day to go. And that was back in the 60s. And that was pretty well cleaned up with natural gas out there. You run uh, the, the, the dirtiest part of Los Angeles today is the port of Los Angeles. They are switching everything over there to LNG, liquefied natural gas. Now Cummings has just come out with a nine liter engine that I met with the Cummings people and I said what it's 90 percent cleaner on NOx emissions. NOx. Now am I talking about greenhouse? No, I'm asking a different question. All right. I, I agree with everything you've said about uh, smog producing emissions, but I'm talking about greenhouse gas emissions. In other words, methane has a greenhouse gas effect I, I like know. CO2 and it's a potent one. And yeah. it, it could well be that the greenhouse gas emissions from using natural gas in trucks is greater than the greenhouse gas from using diesel in trucks, even though the smog producing emissions from a natural gas trucks you're, you're are, are clean, much, you're are up much one less. Thing, but you aren't helping the others, what you're saying. Correct. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I can't debate uh, the question, uh, but I, I know that, that, uh, that you, it's the methane that's bothering you in, in the deal. 
but the methane's burned, and uh, and the uh, the Cummings people said to me, they said this engine we have, this nine liter engine, ninety percent cleaner on NOx emissions, and it's cleaner than the grid. Is the way they identified the engine. Uh, that's what I've heard also. Yeah. And it's also then there's also another technical question, which is how you go about measuring greenhouse gas emissions and where and over what period of time, and that also you can have a range of a range of variables that come into play there that can that could either make natural gas look more more GHG uh, potent than uh, than than diesel, and yet common sense tells you the other way around. We've got time for one more question over here, please. Can we go to the back there? The back young man in the back? Thank you. Uh, my name is Luis Aragon. I'm an energy economist uh, from Colorado School of Mines. Uh, my question is, are you hiring? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> my question, Mr. Biggins, is, and this is a medium to long-term question, do you have any thoughts or, or any fear from an eventual natural gas cartel uh, coming? Because uh, right now you have very different prices, right? You're talking $2.70 per MCF in North America. I think in Japan is well above $15. Europe has different prices. Everything is different throughout the region. But as the world moves and shifts towards natural gas. Stay on that point just a second. Yes, sir. Okay, you said fifteen dollars, uh, different place. You know, a lot of that is indexed off of oil. Yeah, cool. explain that to them. It's just the way that the, 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 they do the long-term contracts for simplicity purposes, so that they are they're, you can go into a ten, twenty-year long-term contract of supp of of suppliers, not shifting the price dramatically. Yeah, they, they're not, they, it has nothing to do with supply availability. What it is, they'll, it's your price is set on natural gas off of BTU uh, evaluation is what it is. It, but the uh, Mideast countries, uh, are they, they price all their natural gas off of off indexed oil. I see. So in a nutshell, my question is, do you, ri do you see a risk 10, 20, 30 years from now of Qatar, Iran, Russia, and all the other big natural gas producers kind of coming together in a cartel-like... Well, another OPEC. Correct, yes, sir. But for natural gas. Yeah, but... more but LNG but terminals come, come online. Okay, what was missing in the OPEC cartel? I mean, why was the OPEC cartel... Uh, they, they're selling 30 million barrels a day out of 93 million, but it's all under uh, one roof, and so they can adjust production down. They can't do much for adjusting it up. The uh, Saudis, I didn't believe, could sustain two, uh, 10 million a day, and they they did uh, last year. They held it at 10.7. They impressed the hell out of me because I didn't think they could do it. But there, the other countries, you don't have an oversupply uh, opportunity for them. So, But what was missing in that cartel was offsetting oil someplace else to compete with it. So when you get the natural gas cartel, you do have U.S. natural gas. And we have more natural gas than anybody in the world. Thank you very much. In the interest of, we have two questions on this side, so in the interest of balance, we're going to have another one over on this side. Bill Holland, I'm a reporter with SNL Energy. And my question to you, Mr. Pickens, is first of all, an observation. We spoke uh, six years ago at COGA in Denver when you rolled out the Pickens plan. You look fabulous. Look what? Fabulous. Thank you. You're welcome. My question is, is you, all along in this, in this talk. You know that was my father. <laughs> <laughs> all along in our discussion today, you've been very quick to note where you were wrong. And, in 70 whatever and and 85 and you're very quick to know what you've been on we all kind of know you've been a little bit successful so could you tell us where you were right where I was right yeah 
Well, CNBC said I was right 19 out of 21 times on the prediction for oil. And they said, how do you do it? And I said, that guy, Naimi, uh, Saudi Arabia oil minister, I said, I watch what he says, and I say the same thing two weeks later. <laughs> and I said, it, he's usually right. So where have I been right? I, you know, it, I've, I've had some good runs. The, uh, it's, it's interesting that uh, something we haven't mentioned and should, and I can put it in this question, but five times since 1980, the same thing has happened as we are experiencing today for oil prices. They had a huge drop. And when they did, out of the five times, four of them, the Saudis stabilized the market by cutting their production. And they said this time made it very clear that they were not going to cut production, which meant was you, the United States, are going to be the swing producer for a while. You're going to be the one that cuts. Well, it, I, I didn't find anything wrong with what they said. I, was, I appreciated them telling me they weren't going to cut. They didn't cut either. And But the United States had been the one. It had come from 4 million barrels a day in five years to 9.7 million barrels a day. So we were adding a million barrels a year. The United States was. We're the one that oversupplied the world, not anybody else. We were totally to blame. To blame, uh, it, it happened. Typical of the industry in America, they will overdrill. We are notorious for it. If things are going good and the price is right, let it rip. Keep drilling. I was on the board of a company that was 99% natural gas, and we had 1,400 rigs running in the United States for natural gas 10 years ago. And I told on this board, I said, fellas, this thing going to be overdrilled. I'd, I'd shut down those rigs. Nah, hell no, you can't shut down the rigs. You got to go ahead and drill, go ahead and drill. Today, you have one, you have, uh, 85 rigs running for natural gas. You had 1,400 then. We overdrilled. That's why we have so much natural gas. That's why the price is so low. It's that simple. Where was I right? I'm trying to go through this and trying to remember where I was right. <laughs> the, what wind and solar? I was right on wind and solar. The uh, yes, you should use them. They're they're great power sources for us. But the price has to get right to be able to use them. The American people are going to buy the cheapest. I can promise you that. They will buy the cheapest, and that's why I've kept believing that natural gas. You get it in front of them, but they have to change the car, and it's uh, it's a different engine. I mean set up. Is it going to cost more? A little more. It'll cost a little more to go to natural gas. So I don't try to sell natural gas to you, the guy with the passenger car. But you don't use much fuel anyway. You only use 500 gallons a year. I want those big trucks out there using 20, 30,000 gallons a year. Those are the ones to switch over. You know, I'm going to Bring in the Bible here. You know, Moses pointed the Israelites to the promised land, but didn't take them there. It was Joshua who took them there. What you've been hearing today is America's energy Moses. He's been pointing us in this direction. What we need now, I think, is an American energy Joshua who's really going to lead us and really put together the policies that are going to make it work. Thank you. And I think he's going to find it in what the words of wisdom you've heard today and in the work that Mr. Pickens has done with the Pickens plan and really all of your life. And I want to thank you for being here and speaking to us, and thank you for your great contribution as well. Thank you. Thank you.